everyone for our Bulls Market Place birthday event. Uh, tonight's, sustain uh, tonight's sustainability meeting, we don't have a forum, so we um, So uh, just for the agenda tonight, we'll have Dr. Lee from the University of Illinois, who will be sharing um, the importance of insects and how they can play a role. So just to give a little background on uh, Dr. Aileen, uh, she is an assistant professor at, of entomology with an affiliate in the Department of Mechanical Science and Engineering at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. She hold, also holds an appointment at the Beckham Institute at, for Advanced Science and Technology. Her research group, the Alien Bio Inspiration Collaborative, also known as the ABC Lab, uses a wide variety of insects, including cicadas and quick beetles, as inspiration for the novel design of materials and mechanical systems. To close uh, the knowledge loop, her research then uses those materials and systems to study biology. Dr. Aileen is currently the past president, serving as president in 2023 for the Entomological Society of America. Her insects also hold, also include science policy and science communication. Important skills when tackling insect biodiversity loss due to climate change and predicting how those insect abundances might populations of plants and other animals. Professor Aileen received her BA in Integrative Biology from the University of California, California Berkeley. Her ent entomology and from the Riverside and her PhD in ent entomology from the University of Illinois. And, oh, oh absolutely. Yes, yeah, so sorry. Um, we had all, um, yeah, we have the, So sorry, I was a bit quiet, but uh, the village would also like to announce that as a part of this event, we have also been recently named a uh, bird city. So there will be <laughs> future presentations coming um, from Bird City, Illinois, and they'll be coming to future uh, SEC meetings to give further presentations and help with uh, future activities to help protect our migratory birds in Lake Bluff. So without further ado, I will pass on the microphone. This is better. All right. Can you hear me? Is, that, is this loud enough? Am I projecting? Uh, yeah. No, but I can assure that does the yeah. Okay. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. When I first got the invite of a microphone, and then do I need to turn it to the microphone? Test one, two, three. Does that make a difference? It sounds better in here. Okay. <laughs> All right. This is weird. All right. <laughs> All right. So I can start beatboxing here. Um, so, thank you for the invitation. Um, I am an entomologist. I don't really know that much about birds. I know birds eat insects. That's, that's one of the things. But um, I'm going to weave it in for a little bit, and there's also, of course, a lot of topics that overlap between entomology and ornithology. And so, uh, bear with me. And um, I also would love to be interrupted if you have questions or you have insights. Um, I, um, but I'm, I'm really privileged to be um, able to talk to you about my research. So um, this, this talk then is part of World Migratory Bird Day, which is, uh, the theme this year is, um, if we need to protect insects, if we want to protect birds. Uh, birds uh, rely on insects. And because it has been shown that in many uh, places insects are declining, uh, birds are declining also. So um, there is a blog post that came out a couple of weeks ago um, that actually covers this really well. It was uh, on the Searcy Society blog. Highly recommend you uh, read that by Sebastian Echeverry. And um, the author does mention there also that many birds rely on bugs, insects, for food during the most important parts of their lives. 
So either, a lot of um, uh, uh, some birds are considered insectivores. They only eat insects, but there's also many birds that eat seeds. However, during certain times of their life, they actually are fed, uh, also feed on insects, like when they're in the nest. Uh, the, par <coughs> the parents may bring them uh, insects. So um, uh, that means then that they're uh, closely connected. And in fact, birds and bugs, uh, insects, are facing the same threats. So because of things like habitat loss, uh, pesticide use, uh, all these things, um, they herd uh, insects and they also herd um, uh, uh, birds. Of course, as an entomologist, we come from at it from two sides. There's also many insects that are pests and so they feed on our crops, so they affect uh, food security. Uh, many insects are also vectors of diseases, so they affect, uh, they have an uh, influence public health. Um, so, um, you know, the, 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 I think as the Entomological Society of America, we do um, support judicious use of pesticides because otherwise we'll have a lot of other uh, problems. But um, uh, overall, we have the same, we are dealing with the same threats. So the Entomological Society of America, this is where I was the president of last year, uh, is the largest collection of insect scientists in the world. It's like 7,000 members. And um, we, and we have a huge, uh, a big task force going on right now that is trying to uh, come up with how our society can help with uh, uh, biodiversity loss or preventing biodiversity loss, specifically in insects, of course. And uh, there will be like an action plan coming out, like can we to together we can take action for insects and therefore also for birds. So I see there's a lot of overlap. Um, so why is biodiversity of birds and insects important? Uh, well, uh, you know, I, I've listed a couple there. Well, a seven, I guess. Uh, first of all, um, it's probably moral reasons. Like why who we, we should take care of our environment. There's also there that it's been shown important for um, uh, all natural functions. So for instance, this, in this case, insect biodiversity affects bird biodiversity. So there is this interconnection that um, if, or if we lose um, certain plants, that's going to affect our, um, our pollinators, for instance, for us and so on. Of course, there's also aesthetic reasons to be near nature and, and have a variety of nature. So that is another reason why biodiversity is important. Um, there's a continuance of evolutionary processes. If you just take away a whole um, a, a bunch of taxa like insects or birds, um, evolution might, might end um, and you don't get more biodiversity uh, in the future. Um, and then also biodiversity provides actual and potential material and economic benefits. Um, if, um, if plants in, say, wetlands disappear, wetlands will uh, not provide um, uh, nesting sites for, for birds, but they also will um, increase the chance of flooding of major disasters when hurricanes come through and so on. So that is where if you you need to take care of the of nature to actually get uh, a be economic benefits. And then there's this insurance. Uh, if you have more biodiversity, you are more re uh, resilient, and uh, so we can you can recover from other from natural disasters or disasters made by by humans. The seventh one, and I'm kind of putting some space in between there, is. Um, that it is, provides a solution space for bio-inspired design. And I'm just, uh, that is my area of research. So I'm gonna kind of focus on that. Uh, but that does not mean that it is, you know, really up there compared to uh, moral reasons or uh, the reasons for evolu evolutionary processes to continue. It is just my area. And I hope I can show you 
why then biodiversity is so, so important for that part. And I'll explain what bio-inspired design is. So <coughs> uh, why uh, arthropod uh, diversity is so important for my research is that uh, what, what, I do, what I study is what can we learn from insects or other animals, it's just like, and, and plants, plants also. I, I'm just an entomologist, so I focus on insects. Uh, what, how have insects solved certain problems that maybe we can learn from? What kind of solutions can they provide for us? So if you have great arthropod diversity, great insect diversity, then you will also have a, a, an immense um, uh, a solution space, a diversity of solutions. So for instance, here you have insects that fly. There's a honey up there. There's a fly um, with that stri the striped eyes. Uh, so they are really, really good flyers. Um, what is the, the one next to the fly is a termite. So it's really good at digesting uh, wood. Um, uh, there's beetles there, hoppers. So maybe we can build stuff that can jump, uh, robots that can jump, all based on that. So, I, so, so hopefully um, I can make this point here in this talk. So what I do in the uh, bio so the Aline Bioinspiration Collaborative is I'm first of all I am a biologist so I was trained in that orange space and I love that orange space that's where I want to be I want to understand biology and then explore a little bit about what were the constraints and opportunities that maybe natural selection but also we can maybe take advantage of. And again, I'll s give some examples in a little bit. And then from there, we move to actually creating solutions based on what we learned from biology. So if we have a, bio uh, we understand how a fly flies, then ultimately we might wanna build a robot that can fly in the same manner as a fly. So that's what I mean. But what, again, I love that orange space I also want to go the, the, uh, uh, the different direction. I also want to use whatever we're creating, these prototypes, these ro robots, to go backwards, to help us explain why we're seeing in biology what we're seeing. So um, again, I'll show you an example of that of one of our projects. Another way to uh, explain that is, on the left-hand side, we call this bio-inspired engineering or bio-inspiration or biomimicry, uh, basically so you're learning from biology to improve engineering systems. And it can be, again, like I keep saying, a robot, but it can also be materials. It can be how uh, computers talk to each other, which is kind of like how um, honeybees talk to each other. It, it's like it, the, it's the possibility are endless, but you're learning from biology. And then where my lab? sets itself apart is that we also go the other direction. We're, we're applying the en these engineering models, these prototypes and other experimental tools that otherwise are just used by, en by engineers to help explain, uh, answer key biological questions. And again, I am going to focus on insects, but there's also, I work very closely with somebody on the on click beetles, but actually her primary research is on birds, like how birds fly. She's a biomechanics person, and she says, so it can be anything. It can be plants. I think plants are understudied in this space. Um, but, and so it can be any kind of organism that we can learn from. Okay, so I was talking about biodiversity loss, biodiversity of insects, that there's so many. And even in my lab, this is already like kind of overwhelming sometimes. I have six students and each one of them works on something different. My head sometimes spins when I have meetings with them, when I read their papers. When I, so I work on cicadas and flies and click beetles, which is on the left. I work on honeybees and ticks and uh, roly poly or uh, 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 pill bugs on the right. And then in the middle also uh, what are called leaf hoppers. Hopefully I'll get that into that in a little bit. Dragonflies, grasshoppers, and regular old beetles. 
that are shiny. Uh, so that diversity is already reflected in my lab. Okay, so I want to just say, uh, get, uh, um, give a little here uh, because I did not realize this as I signed up. I said yes to this, but that we were going to be literally inundated with cicadas, which is actually perfect in this case. So I have the I have the T-shirt on and everything. So I'm and I'm putting brief in in um, quotes here because brief. When you think about these um, cicadas, these periodical cicadas, they've been underground either, uh, the ones around here have been underground for 17 years. So um, it's not brief. Um, and this is actually from a really nice article in the New York Times on the periodical cicada, if you wanna look that up. Um, and this is an original, is a picture by Charles Marlott from 1907. He was a scientist who first describe these different broods uh, that we're seeing now. He, so he, uh, I think he was from Wisconsin, I want to say, or Minnesota. And the one that came out there, he called that number one. And then, so now here in, uh, uh, in Chicago right now is brood uh, 13. Okay. Uh, just want to explain that there's two types of cicadas. Um, there's uh, all over the world, there are what we call annual cicadas. These cicadas appear every year around here, this usually around July or August. You, you, we call them dog day cicadas. And, um, they, they're called annual because they come out every year, but, it's, but as, an, as an individual, they have been underground for three or four years. So it's not, you know, it's not like they, o they only live a year, they live pretty long. And then, uh, so, and then, in, um, uh, then you, you compare that to the periodical cicadas, which are the ones that we see now, right now, that are, came out in May and will uh, com keep coming out in June or be around in June. So they actually have, uh, st they were underground uh, 17 years, the ones here, and the other ones that are in the news that are more in southern Illinois and all the way uh, to the east, to Virginia, they've been underground for 13 years. And they emerge all together, all at once. It's a huge party, right? Has anybody, everybody seen it already around the neighborhood? Yeah. Um, so those are periodical cicadas. Also, as an entomologist, I've, I've like answered a lot of questions now about cicadas this year, and also three years ago when they came out on the East Coast a lot. And uh, um, uh, I also always want to uh, point out that true uh, American exceptionalism right here. These cicadas only occur in North America. Maybe a couple in Canada, not right now, but of some broods I think go into Canada, but otherwise these periodical cicadas are only in, North, in, in the United States. And, uh, but annual cicadas again are pretty much the world over. But um, yeah, so yay. Because uh, it's fantastic. All right, so these cicadas in Illinois, uh, annual cicadas, there are actually about 20 species in, uh, in Illinois. Uh, and uh, the one on the top left is um, the one that you find around parks, around here, also in central Illinois, where I live, of course. And uh, it's a pretty nondescript, it's pretty big. It's a big cicada. And it makes that noise that I always associate with summer. It's like, yes, it's just somewhere ago. Like, that, which is, I grew up in West, Western Europe. I never heard cicadas. It's definitely a very distinct mis Midwestern thing, it seems like. Um, and then periodical cicadas, we in Illinois have about three different species. So that's also, it gets kind of tricky, right? So you have two broods, and each brood has different species in it. So, um, so that makes things sometimes, but, uh, but also, I do those three that emerge right at the same time. How come they are not really distinct from each other? This year is, is interesting because the two broods actually overlap in a certain area, right around Champaign-Urbana. Uh, and uh, 
So we're, the, the researchers are wondering what is going to happen when they actually meet each other. They haven't seen each other in 200 some years, right? 80, they have not seen each other since 1802. I don't know what they do underground. Maybe they do <laughs> meet each other. But uh, they have not, uh, what did the New York Times uh, say, not since the Louisiana Purchase have they seen each other. So that's uh, 1802. So because they only come out 13 and 17 years. I'm not good at math, but that, that's when the two meet together not often. All right, so this year is where these different, uh, it's actually cicada mania uh, this year here in Illinois. So if you go to cicadamania.com, so much research, uh, so much information. It's a little bit overwhelming, but there's a lot of great stuff. And uh, so we now have uh, Brood 19, uh, which is a 13-year uh, periodical cicada, which is more in, uh, well, we have Brood uh, 13, that one, 13, which is a 17-year periodical cicada, which is right here, that dark area around Chicago, northern Illinois. And then that 19 cicada, which is a 13-year periodical cicada, is more to the south but it goes all the way east to, um, to Virginia. Uh, and then you can kind of see that there is a little bit of overlap. Uh, there may be some overlap. Um, this does not necessarily mean that there's like double the amount of cicadas, like it's obvious that they overlap because the edges are already, there's less, uh, fewer. So if two edges meet, it's not. Uh, it's not really cicada mania <laughs> in, Ch in Champaign-Urbana, for instance. All right, so in this, this is from that New York Times article. You can see the top one, the dark brown. Those are the cicadas that you have around here. And then the reddish brown ones are the ones that we, we have in Champaign-Urbana. So every two, 221 years. Okay, so let's go back <laughs> to uh, uh, what I study, because it happens actually that I do study cicadas. Um, so uh, I have all those other things we study too, but also cicadas. So I want to, again, use that as an example of where we do bio-inspired desi uh, design and we do en engineering informed biology. Okay, uh, this may be, uh, I don't know, without a pointer. Um, so let's look at this uh, uh, picture on the right hand side. I wanted to point out what a beautiful material insect cuticle is. So cuticle is another word for exoskeleton um, and it is uh, shrimp also have it so it's not that so if you um, so most arthropods have a cuticle. And it can vary, right? Like so you guys probably when you're working in the yard you find grubs and they're kind of squishy and soft, especially if you touch them. But they actually turn into beetles or flies, which can be really hard. But it's still made out of cuticle. It's just how the cuticle is arranged, how the molecules are arranged that give them these different properties. And overall, uh, the cuticle is made out of maybe six elements from the periodic table. It's not, it, they make it from the ground up. So if you look at that really colorful, Part, those are the molecules, uh, those are like sugars and things like that that get together and make these long uh, uh, molecules that then arrange themselves in these fibers and then those fibers organize um, at the top right and then you get, you get a flat, uh, flat part of the cuticle and that starts stacking up differently so you get kind of like plywood that um, second from the right at the top kind of looks like plywood and it kind of um, is helical. And then I'll put that all together and you get these, this beautiful material called in a cuticle, um, which can withstand many forces. It's hard to crack cuticle. Uh, the insects also remember from your basic biology, insects have to molt to grow. So they actually shed oftentimes. When they do that, actually about 80, 90% of that cuticle is reabsorbed. So they are also really good at recycling. Uh, and they make this cuticle 
at regular temperatures and atm atmospheric pressures. Whereas when we usually make materials, especially plastics, it requires a lot of heating, a lot of beating to make the right shape, and a lot of uh, kind of nasty chemicals. So I'm, if it wasn't obvious already, I love the insect food. <laughs> and then it gives you many different uh, functions that you c uh, get from that, called multi so that's multifunctionality. So as I said, you can have this larval form, this grub form that's soft and stretchy. Have really hard, tough, like your beak that each other. Um, that that's uh, it's still cuticle, but it has different properties. And then, uh, on top of that, literally on top of that, is they have many, many surface features. Insects have many, many surface features. I don't know if you know this, but insects have lots of hairs. Actually, they can be quite hairy. Well, of course, you probably have seen honeybees. They're they're quite hairy. Um, but they have many other structures too, which I'll uh, get, in, get into a little bit. So on top of the cuticle itself, actually the structural features are also really important. And they have been shown to um, reflect light a certain way. You have insects that are very shiny. Um, you can have uh, actually uh, the, 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 the it can actually be super refl uh, ref anti-reflective, so they kind of hide uh, in, the, in their background. And uh, as this uh, picture on the bottom left shows, they can also uh, repel water. So those blue things are water droplets. And because this is like at the nanoscale, nano nanometer scale, uh, it repels water. Okay, so this is why, uh, these are my uh, collaborators when I study cicadas, um, uh, uh, Nenad Milkovic in mechanical engineering and Don Kopek at the Army uh, in, um, Corps of Engineers. Um, so what, we've, what we did, what we studied is we studied four different species of cicadas. Uh, remember there are 20, and that was also one of the, when we uh, uh, put in the paper to be published, uh, some people said, well, why didn't you do all 20? Well, it's a lot of work, and also it's actually kind of hard to f find some of these. But we picked four that are very different uh, in their, you know, where they live and how they behave. So that top left one is the one that we find here in the urban areas, in trees. Uh, the, the right, top right one is the one that actually lives in swamps uh, in southern Illinois, in the Shawnee. So you would think that it comes across, um, you know, it's how it deals with water might be different. Uh, the bottom left is probably my favorite. Uh, it's beautiful. Uh, it has a little bit of orange. If you squint, it also has a little bit of blue. I think it would be a perfect mascot for Illinois, but um, <laughs> I think that will be a hard sell. Anyway, uh, so that it's a p really big one, and it lives in prairies. And as you can imagine, we have few prairies left. We also have very few of that uh, cicada. And then we have the bottom right is the periodical cicada, um, which is the one that is coming out now. But you can see how much smaller it actually is to the ones that we usually see in the rest of the summer. And then we tested the wings of these cicadas. How, good, w how well did they repel water? Um, and uh, this is, so if you put this under a scanning electron microscope, these wings, I'm going to kind of go through this because there's a lot of detail here, but um, if you put them under a scanning electron microscope, you see that they have all these little pillars, uh, probably best seen in the bottom left inset there. there. There's like all these little fingers that come up uh, off of the surface of the wing. If you touch the wing, you don't feel them. They're that small, right? They're, they're not, uh, it's not, it doesn't feel to you, our fingers as rough. Um, but if something has these kinds of structures, they become what's called super hydrophobic. So they actually repel water. And let me explain a little bit about that. If you, the top right picture, you see a water droplet. If you put that, if you put a water droplet, say on this wood, it would make a really flat bubble, right? Because it's not really, I don't think it's hydrophobic. Um, it just makes a puddle. But if you have uh, maybe these nano, if you were to have those nano, 
get the droplets like that the, in the green inset there, where the droplet stays perfectly round. Uh, and that is because of this, uh, uh, the physics at that is really complicated at that scale, but there's something about the surface energy that makes it that the just want to stick together. They want to stay together. They don't want to split out. So you, they stay perfectly round. Okay, I'm going to really quick. Um, but say the bottom left, the same arrangement of the cicadas, the, the top and the bottom left are annual cicadas. They're really good at repelling water. Look, they're perfectly round um, water droplets. And then the periodical cicada is kind of, they're kind of starting to just become flat. So it's not as good. Um, and you'd use this really fancy machine to test that kind of stuff, so I won't. Uh, but it gets really extreme, and I hope this works. It can be so repellent that you can actually uh, make them jump. Uh, let's see if this works. I'm not a PC user, so I think I already messed it up here. You see Mickey Mouse there? That's two, that's three. Oh, Mickey Mouse already gone. <laughs> the Mickey Mouse in the middle there has actually three droplets. And when they come together, so much energy, surface energy, that repels them from the surface that when they coalesce, they actually jump. I'll try that one more time. It's like gone. So they have jumped out of the frame of the thing. So, um, so that was also really interesting. And we can talk a little, so that's, that's what's happening here. So here's a schematic. Um, if you actually put in between those uh, water droplets a piece of dirt, you can actually remove the dirt with that if it is that extreme. Another thing that we saw was that if you put a bacteria on these pillars, these nano pillars that are th those uh, blue things, so you have the wings, and then the surface of the wing has these pillars. If a bacterium lands on it, it dies. It is killed. And we know, don't quite know why. It could be, it's like a bed of nails that fails, <laughs> I guess. It could either be that the bacterium just sort of falls in and the membrane is ripped open and dies, or it could be that there's just so much, many stresses as, 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 the, as it pokes to the top that the membrane rips, or it's actually like there's a shearing force that kills the bacteria. So anyway. Having those bacteria makes it also that, uh, ma ma having those nanopillars also makes it that bacteria don't grow on it, on that, on that surface, which is, un which is good for the mesquita, right? Because that keeps the cicada clean um, and not have, and then you don't get dirt on it, which would make it more obvious for the, that the cicada would be seen uh, and so on. You can do this with just creating those structures. You can get um, you can get those functionalities, which was kind of stay a, a, a droplet and would roll off. And they some and if they, as they roll off, they also take dirt, or they would be so hydrophobic that they actually jump and take away dirt, and most importantly, take away heat, which is also another um, function. And you actually kill bacteria. And that's all because of these little uh, th uh, nano pillars. So this is, here's this, those Cheetos. <laughs> those are uh, back to supposed to be bacteria. So having that, that wings like that with those nano pillars, super hydrophobic and um, kill bacteria. Just gonna go through this real quick. We're, so we're actually now at the point where we actually can make this, make these um, uh, cicada wing inspired th um, materials. I mean, I think we could, we could have done this a long time ago too, but for a lot of money. Like you go to a clean lab, what they call a clean lab, and you have like really special equipment. We actually can make these using nail polish. I think it's also um, a perfect example of why having a diverse research group is really important <laughs> because um, 
when I think it was during a lab meeting that one of the women said, so why don't you just try it with nail polish? Like here is a master surface, which is the insect wing, put nail polish on it. And the guy, the guy who was the, he was like, no, I don't know anything about nail polish. So he came back with um, gel nail polish and it didn't work. And so we had to tell him what the difference is between regular nail polish and gel. <laughs> so anyway, again, perfect example of why a diverse research group is really <laughs> handy. Um, so we make it, uh, in the end, uh, it, it's a lot of but we actually can make replicates, uh, replicas of the wings in our lab. We don't have to spend a lot of money on doing this. Um, and, that, and this was actually quite tricky. Okay, I just, this is the slide I actually wanted to get to. If we can make these surfaces very similar to skater wings, these and, and then, like I said, you can be super hydrophobic, which means it repels water. You can take away heat. You can be antimicrobial. Where, do you, uh, where could we apply something like that? How can we learn from nature to, for new technologies? So now it's your turn. Rain gear. Say that again? Rain gear. Rain gear? That's a good one. Uh, that's a, that's a, a very good one. Uh, especially because it is, uh, I want to stress, it is functionalities because of structure. So you don't have to add nasty chemicals. Like Gore-Tex, which has the same uh, application, is actually a pretty nasty chemical. And also it doesn't, it's not as durable. So maybe we can make it as durable as that. Are you activating? Uh, <laughs> I'm not that interested in that. Again, I'm the biologist, but we have been approached uh, by people to do that. Right, so that's that's one of them. Uh, any other ideas? There's no wrong answers here. Medical applications, uh, like in right, right, yeah. Um, this is one. Actually, my students gave a presentation, like uh, trying to, you know, like a Shark Tank. We call it. Ant lion pit competition, which <laughs> is entomologist uh, Shark Tank. Uh, yeah, uh, they actually did a, did a lot of research on how many millions and billions of dollars we spend on making sure that catheters and stints don't get um, bacterial growth on them. And that's why I was also, it's usually disp all disposable, so it creates a lot of, lot of waste. Um, of course, a lot of me, p people also die uh, from it. So yeah, we've we're actually act actively working on creating two. One side has those nanofillers, and that maybe then in, um, bacteria will not settle. The the big problem is once cicadas, or not cicadas, once bacteria settle, this thing called biofilm. And uh, that's when it's, it's bad. So um, any other ideas? So the heat one was actually quite popular with my uh, collaborators who uh, do a lot of heat transfer work on um, like, so can we make better or even just 5% more efficient HVAC systems that, that you know, and you have In, the, in HVAC systems, if you can maybe repel water better so it, it moves through quicker, uh, takes away the heat more or deposits heat, uh, that would be really good. So he, there, that is also getting pursued. Um, I had another idea. Anyway, there's many applications. So this is a perfect example of um, bio-inspired design. Now, again, um, as the biologist, what about enabled biology, what can I learn as a biologist if I have those kinds of materials? Well, uh, why is it that those annual cicadas have the really tall have are super hydrophobic, whereas the periodical ones are kind of eh, right? And, and if I think about it, I think I can explain it by making those nanopillars probably cost some energy, right, as they are developing. Making them absolutely perfect uh, does take energy. 
And, uh, and that is a worthwhile investment for the annual cicadas because they live as adults, meaning they have wings, for about three months. So it's important for them to stay clean. These guys that you see around here, as you notice, they just like they're crawling all over each other, and they will be dead in like two months, two weeks, two or three weeks. So it's not probably not worth it for them to invest any much much energy in creating those pillars, and that's why I receive the difference. So that's you know that's the kind of stuff that I'm now thinking about um, as I'm creating these, um, uh, these materials that have the same kind of surfaces. Now, also, what if I put some chemistry back, like insect? have what's called what are called hydrocarbons on those nano pillars that also I think boosts it a little become a little bit more uh, hydrophobic. So is that worth it for us to also put on our tax replacing textile or shall we can we just completely stay away from chemicals? So anyway that's an example of uh, biology. All right so I just this is um, uh, the work done by student Yu Dao Chen, and she's really, she's creating those, those tubings. She's actually creating, like looking into how do bacteria actually die on those nanopillar surfaces. So um, it's a really exciting time. It's also kind of, uh, so insects do really cool stuff at this scale, right, at this micro scale. Uh, because simple things like because of these kinds of structures that they have on their at the nanoscale, they actually can stick to the ceiling, that kind of stuff, which 30, 40 years ago even, we were like, I don't know how they do it, but now that we have these technologies for imaging that we can actually see what's going on and have the ability to fabricate it, it's really exciting times. Like, well, Leonardo da Vinci, also was an advocate of bio-inspired design. He looked at birds and plastical um, flying thing, things that could fly, but he could not build them. I don't really understand how it worked, right? Uh, the Wright brothers uh, were also inspired by pigeons, and they actually used what they saw in pigeons in their f a couple of first uh, prototypes. So anyway, it's not bio-inspired design is not something new. Okay, slightly different, uh, this work by uh, Lizzie Bello. So that insect that you see there is called a leaf hopper, and they're only maybe two or three millimeters long. They're, they're really, really small, but they're everywhere, <laughs> right? You can, uh, you may swallow them, like every, every time you go on a bike ride, you probably didn't swallow a couple and you wouldn't ever know. Anyway, they're so small, that they have, they have so, when you're that small, you have some major issues. Like if you get a drop of, of water on you, you're gonna, that's bad. Um, if, you, um, if you get too close to each other, probably electrostatic forces are gonna stick. You, the, you, the forces that they have to deal with are very different from, from you know, uh, organisms our size. So one of the things that they have developed is rather than putting Nano pillars on these tiny little wings. They actually make these balls that you see there in the in that inset. Those call, are called brocosomes, um, and they make them in their gut, and then they just kind of poop them out, and then they cover themselves so that their they, their whole body. And then, um, and aren't they beautiful? I mean, they're spheres almost with holes in them, they're hollow on the inside, and they're almost all the same, and then every species has a slightly different brocosome, because those are amazing. How do they make them like that? <coughs> and so we're looking into that. But they, once they cover themselves with it, they're again super hydrophobic, they reflect light in a certain way, uh, and they have, so I have all these different kind of functionalities that has become really interesting. So. I asked you previously, what would be the applications, would be an application for cicada wing material? What could be an application for this? Actually, I don't know about that. So it's the same functionality, but the difference is that you can remove it. You can put it on, 
and then wipe it away and then put it back on and then wipe it away kind of thing. I, don't, I can't really think of <laughs> any application right now, but anybody? Windshield spray that you put on with like rain axe, right? Right, and then I got like that. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. And then if you use your phone as well, right. you know, it's like you spray on your yeah. tires and wash right. it off. So, also, uh, hydrophobic materials are also very interested in the avi aviation industry because once you're super hydro, if you have super hydrophobic, then uh, icing becomes less of a problem. So, uh, maybe. Maybe if you cover it in the winter time with that kind of stuff rather than de-icing, prevent the icing or something like that might be another one. So um, yeah, so we're studying this one because it's just slightly different uh, uh, application. Another one that we've studied is uh, it's quite tricky. If you make those nano pillars, uh, what if you put like an iron molecule at the tip of it and then put a magnet above it, like can you actually move it? So when the straight up, your material is super hydrophobic. If you put the magnet so you kind of lie down, then it's not super hydrophobic. It's kind of again, you can play with the functionality. In the, in, but, you know, the pudding, Excuse yeah. Me, question. Yes. You know, we're looking at water droplets here, but water has so many different properties. Mm -hmm. There's acid rain. Then there's chemicals in well water, and then there's minerals in all water. Right. So all of these various, there's salt water. So, and there's ice. Right. And there's steam. And some water's this temperature, and some water is that temperature at different times of the day. Right. Or in different seasons. How do those variables affect the properties that we're talking about? Yeah. Uh, that, this is, yeah, just the tip of the iceberg when we're just playing with deionized water. Like the very simplest gotcha. form. Uh, yeah, and very, uh, you, those those are very good points, um, and uh, yeah, we really should should uh, extend on that, and we, hopefully we will. Um, where was I? I actually had another point there. Oh, one of the things that we have studied, and I think I took the slide out, is that cicadas were actually the easiest one to study because they have big wings, they're very sturdy. And they have these beautiful, simple, just nano pillars, which I guess is that C one, like under C. If you go to flies, fly and flies actually, they live in some really nasty habitats, right? They they love poop and decaying stuff. And um, so, how do they stay clean? So, what we found is that they have those nano pillars too, like under C. But they also have hairs like under like the G1 or the uh, HII1, they have hairs. So the nanopillars seem to be able to deal with droplets that are pretty small. So like um, that, you, that kind of just sprinkle on it. Whereas the hairs are able to deal with bigger droplets which form as something condenses, like at the time of the day, which the time of day is really important. Um, and so having a combination of the two really helps them. So again, millions and millions of, of uh, insects, <laughs> millions of millions of um, ways that they have solved this problem. And uh, plants maybe even more so because plants also need to stay clean and free of disease because if they're not clean, they can't photosynthesize. So that's the end of them. So how do these things that don't even move, how do they stay clean? Mm -hmm. so, it's kind of, uh, so there's all these possibilities for where can, we can learn from. Does that answer your question? I, I have very good points. Acid rain? <laughs> no. it's, it seems to right. get me thinking about it when you're talking about playing with the icing. Yeah. Or is there a quick cut system? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So we do say, uh, we are, have studied what's the difference between condensation and between evaporation, like what happens to these droplets as they're actually uh, uh, evaporating. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's differences. Yeah. Cool, great. Any other questions? Yeah. So are these structures made of carbon only, or? These what? These, uh, these structures. The brochosomes? Yeah, uh, that's the other thing. It's lipids and proteins. 
Um, so it is not really any different from, uh, from the rest of the body. I mean, it's not uh, particular, it's not as, uh, as uh, not quite the same as the cute skeleton, but it's just lipid and proteins. But then how do they get together like that? How do they come together? So yeah, this is a pretty new project, but it's, and it was initially funded by the army actually. So um, yeah, <laughs> we'll take it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I just really brief, I'll just show some other projects. Uh, this is from uh, Sissy's work. He actually studies uh, grasshopper spiders, uh, and it's hind wing of a grasshopper. I don't know if and and if you ever uh, opened up a hind wing of a grasshopper, it's very corrugated. And so, if you make gliders uh, like aerial aerial vehicles that have that corrugation in them, they actually glide fat further. So, um, I mean, we're not nowhere near a glider like a uh, grasshopper or the having active flight um, like birds do, even though it is a uh, So that's one uh, studies um, these electrostatic force probably a lot of weird stuff is going on right now with these wind uh, how and how right as something like a honey charged air, how does the charge on its body change, and is that important? Well, we some uh, shown that it is important for pollen collection. Uh, if these ele these ele helps the pollen stick onto the stay on. But we're also wondering if it matters for getting actually the sense of the uh, to the right places on the antenna. Anyway, so that's a, a kind of um, uh, sensing systems can we maybe build that are like that. <laughs> okay, so... Um, and then is, this is also a new one, uh, uh, kind of, uh, uh, is and very straightforward actually, is uh, can we build buildings that uh, can go from 2D to 3D really quickly? And uh, by studying the muscle actuation, like how do muscles in the pillow in the armadillo actually make it that it's round in this 3D uh, thing, whereas as a, a regular, it's, it's pretty flat. So. That's kind of a fun one to do. I think I'm excited about really starting that this summer. There's no, hardly anybody works on pill bugs, which it's like, why? They're everywhere. Um, so, I, but I can see here like uh, um, building buildings for um, uh, refugees or uh, natural disasters or um, Actually, if you if you can envision like this at a smaller scale, if you if you then put a whole bunch of them together, and uh, maybe make a bigger building that can come back together, um, uh, be be smaller. All right, Should you want to keep going, or like this is another project that's kind of cool, but we can also stop, and I can answer all kinds of questions about cicadas and other stuff. How about just, I'll try this in like five minutes, because <laughs> this is kind of cool. This is, uh, these are, st uh, this is work on click beetles. Everybody, anybody ever touch a click beetle and see what they did? Oh. This is a click beetle. It's le when it's on its back, it cannot get up, except, as most insects cannot get up this way, it actually clicks and throws itself into the air. Seen this? You have it? Three for a certain cicada this afternoon. Yeah. Uh, and a number of them were like that. They were on their backs. They were turning over. Right. But then they went back on their backs. Oh, they're not 
not the brightest. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, um, yeah, they, they're not the brightest. Was there some reason that they were on the class? Um, I would. Reasons such as the color of the stone? Yeah, the yeah, uh, and they do it. So, so. Uh, and they're the only kind of, the only beetles, there's like one group of beetles that can do this. Um, but I don't think that mechanism actually evolved for jumping because, uh, or to write yourself. And I'm actually gonna use bio-inspired design or the opposite, the other direction to help me explain why it did involve, evolve. So when a click beetle ends up on its back, like the cicada does, it, it it could like wriggle and wriggle, maybe even be pushed over, uh, or somebody, a uh, nice person who, like you, will ride it. Uh, these beetles will jump up, straight up, and then come back down, and 50% of the time, they end up on their backs again. <laughs> so it's not really, and they could, if they wanted to, they could deploy their wings, they have wings, and then just fly. They also go straight up and down. So if it is to get away from a predator, that's not a good way like, to get away from a predator. Uh, what's another reason? Oh, as you can see, they're very, very flat. And I think, I mean, that's a much better way to get rid, uh, to uh, ensure that you not get caught. I'll show you one more time. See how flat they are? They usually just go into crevices and then play dead. But um, if they're out in the open, they will do this on camera, preferably. And then they're, whoop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so why do they do this? Uh, and, and why is this interesting to engineers? It is interesting for, to in for engineers because it is what is called a latch medi mediated uh, spring system, actuator meaning they somehow store energy and then really quickly release it, which means that they create way more power. So it's the same uh, 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 principle as bow. So if you were to throw the arrow just with your arm, it would go, mind, probably go halfway, you know, not that far. When you put a bow, you do it with a bow, your hand is the latch and your muscles contract and then also a lot of then a lot of that energy is stored in the bow. You keep it latched, and you take your time. You don't do this fast, right? You do it slow. So all that potential energy is now here, like it's now in this whole system, that whole red system there in the bow. And then all of a sudden you let go the latch, and now all that energy is now quickly converted into kinetic energy and more power. And it goes further, right? So how, so we think click beetles do the same thing. Um, so but we have to describe where's the latch, what's the spring, and how does it release it. So we're not, we're not there yet, how to explain this, but this is kind of interesting. So you see that peg there? Sorry, go a little closer. Okay. Boom. So here this, this peg is like latching onto another part of the body. And all of a sudden it slips and then it just jumps. So I always say it's like this is that peg and it goes over a ledge and it just holds on, holds on, holds on, and then all of a sudden it slips and that makes it propel. It's right? Where is it really? Really? Basically like you're putting pressure onto another coin and as it slips off, right. it pops us. Right, right. Another one, a toy that is like that are those, those, um, uh, what are they called? Like they're perfectly round, like they're popper, they're poppers. And so you push them in the other way, and then all of a sudden they go like this. So it's kind of like this. Yeah. And of course, not like, not just, not to make a necessarily a jumping robot, even though I do describe myself sometimes as the anti-Sarah Connor. Sarah Connor was the, one, was the woman that pretty much saved us from Terminator, right? By having <laughs> the, the uh, uh, yeah. So I, if the thing that is gonna save us from robots ter uh, taking over is that we can always kick them over and they can't get up, 
I'm going to be the one to solve that problem. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, no, I, so, so uh, their engineers are interested in like putting that scale of into that small of devices. Like for instance, in the medical field, uh, maybe to hold uh, or something like that. So there's many, it's not necessarily that engineers want to build a robot that can jump. It is because uh, there's this power generating mechanism that is due to having a cuticle, like having that kind of material and that kind of ar architecture that's important. Again, I'm more interested in the biology. Um, is so I play around with these models of plague beetles that we do 3D print. So we 3D print all these in my lab, I'm a biology lab, but I have 3D printers. So as you maybe can see on the top right, I actually changed the curvature a little bit of these prototypes. Something you can't do with beetles, right? Because the beetles are what they are. You can't just start messing around with it. But so that helps us inform like how do they get so high? Why do they go vertical? Uh, and those kinds of things. And then the other thing that is really interesting to me, I'm gonna go here. If not for jumping, then why do they have this mechanism uh, that is sort of in between their, the head and the, and the abdomen area? Well, if you, um, um, if you ever come across one, you should hold it in your fingers, between your fingers, and eventually these, these As it's clicking and this person is holding it, do you see how it's wiggling out? That person is holding on pretty tight. You can hold on very tight. But just by this clicking, this beetle just gets out. And that's it. So, um, so that is kind of my hypothesis. So the top right is what most uh, of us study to aid in self-writing, but we know that that's not a very good way because 50% of the time it just ends in the same place. Maybe it's actually the click that startles because it also is, it's audible. You can hear click. So maybe uh, predators would go, ah, that's too scary. That's probably one of my favorite finds of free uh, photography, <laughs> like <laughs> copyright free photography. Um, and, or is it uh, used to jump uh, some distance, uh, which is not the case either because usually they go straight up and down. So I'm really interested in, is this a good way to get out of tight spaces? So these beetles usually live in tunnels, which is that top yellow one oval. Um, maybe this is a good way to get out of that tunnel when, once you're an adult. Maybe it's a good way to get out of a spider web or maybe it's a good way to get out of a bird's beak uh, before you get, um, anyway. So uh, if you, maybe not with the cicadas. <laughs> I, I, yesterday I heard a story of somebody else who saved a cicada who had landed, had landed in a pool, I think. And that person saved the cicada out of the pool, dried it off, <laughs> you know, and then let it go and within a, two seconds a bird got it and ate it <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was uh, uh so so these and then you know cicadas have no way of getting out they're kind of uh, uh done um yeah so uh this is study then that maybe um plague beetles can get out of it and we do this with modeling uh first but this summer we're actually built like a whole uh to uh, to study this anyway i, I won't uh, take up too much more of your time. Okay, so uh, let's, I also study team science, like why do some projects work, even though you have to have these teams that are very, very diverse. Um, I think one secret is I'm actually married to an engineer for already like 30 years, so I think I got, I, I know how to talk to one, at least one engineer, um, uh, or not talk, so. Uh, anyway, so we study a lot, like how how do actually uh, interdisciplinary teams or transdisciplinary teams work well together, uh, which is really important in a, this kind of a space. Okay, let me 
say thank you to all these people. And thank you. And I hope I didn't ramble on too much, but, and I take any questions, yes. Okay, I wanna ask you about two insects that we're very familiar with, ticks and mosquitoes. And certain properties that we know about ticks. They are very hard at Cisco. Mm -hmm. So if you try a tick that's not in Georgia, you try to smash, it's very, very hard. Yeah. But yet, when they, So I'm wondering if you've ever looked at this very hard surface that, you know, when the insect needs it to, it expands. Yeah. So that's one thing about the ticks. The other thing about mosquitoes is, and I've heard this, I don't know if it's true, but you don't feel them biting you right away because there's some type of, they're anesthetizing the skin so you don't feel mm -hmm. the pain. So I'm wondering about how that works. All right. So first of all, about the cuticle, yes. Um, that is true, and, but even I think when it's engorged, it's hard to, 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 to break the cuticle, right? I th that is a, uh, I have some physics, like material, that's material properties. So there's a, a difference between something being brittle, like easy to break, mm -hmm. and something that is, has elastoviscosity, which is like when, they, when it's able to be flexible, right? So, so there's, uh, there's that. So it depends on what kind of forces you put on that. So if you're just squeezing, um, uh, it just doesn't break. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but if you were to, you know, to uh, maybe have a really sharp edge or something, it, might, it would break. Right? But I wouldn't do that on a. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's why I love the cuticle. It's it is fairly simple in its makeup. But just by the reorganization of the molecule in the, these different layers, you get these different properties. Now, the mosquito one is actually, uh, that is a really interesting one, and it actually has inspired, uh, bio-inspired uh, needles. So yes, it does, it does uh, also um, inject uh, an um, anesthetizing, is that a, a fancy word? Um, but also the, the way uh, it actually injects there is a, it's thin, I think there's a movement between the different, like, like a kind of saw into it, but it into the skin, but it's very delicate. So yeah, so those have been used to inspire new kind of needles um, uh, to, for uh, different, but of course then it's so thin, like there's not much that can go through uh, it. So yeah, but there are some bio-inspired, mosquito-inspired needles. Also, another one is uh, um, there's a lot of wasps that are really long ovipositors, these things that they use to lay eggs, which in wasps, in, in the wasps that we know have developed into stingers, uh, but uh, the wasps that are not stinging, they're also able to use these really delicate, um, flexible uh, ovipositors to get through wood. They try to get into lay eggs into caterpillars that may be living inside wood. So again, that's uh, something that people are studying to how do they do that? What are the material properties? What are, so how is the architecture of, of the needle important in getting that accomplished? Yeah. I think I just need to answer our next slide. Uh -oh. Wow, yeah, uh, it's not as bad as we thought in the beginning that there would be no more honeybees because there are still honeybees. Um, but I think we learned a lot from that whole experience. Uh, one of the things is uh, bee collapse uh, was not due to just one thing. It was many different things. It was um, uh, uh, pesticides being brought into the hive or it was um, uh, the um, explosion of this mite that lives in, in honeybee hives that is actually hurting them, they, like it feeds on their blood. Um, we also learned that honeybees are actually kind of wimpy. Uh, European honeybees, and here I can say this as a European, they're kind of wimpy. Uh, they've been interbred, they've been 
you know, bread for making honey, not necessarily to stay healthy. Um, so um, we learned from that the importance of native honeybees is also really, really important, and other kinds of bees for pollination. So yeah, it was not as bad as I thought it would be, um, but we learned a lot, and also just like how do you find out what the cause is? It was really scary there for a while. Very similar to like when we remember when we did not didn't know anything about COVID, like it could be anything, right? And then the same was with the the collapse. Just yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a huge business. Uh -huh. Yeah, with all, all. Yeah, so, so there's a, that's, um, again, I'm not a connoisseur, there's a, actually, a, I have a, a, a colleague at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, New Jersey, I ever wanted to have somebody speak on this. Um, uh, uh, native bees are even more important, probably, in, in this kind of setting. Uh, another thing, though, uh, we're, he also has a lot of experience with working with muni municipal entities on this. For instance, one of them is, um, it's been shown that if you have big solar uh, fields with solar panels, if you grow uh, pollinating plants, or just any plants uh, under it or right around it, they actually become more, the panels become more efficient. Something about airflow and things like that. So what if you then put pollinating, poll plants that could be pollinated by uh, bees to, to help bees would be useful. But, you know, not every case is the same. You also have to deal with power companies. There's, you know, lots of rules with that because the solar field is actually a power generating so you have you have to wear hard hats in the <laughs> in the in the solar field because it's supposed to be an energy generating entity. So anyway, so yeah, it's um, I'm glad you guys are thinking about it. And but um, if you want to learn more about it, my my uh, colleague Adam Dolezal is really involved in that. Yeah, because in the end, it has to be based on science, right? If we like I said, European honeybee, which is the one that maybe is vicious around, is a pretty wimpy. And why should we, you know, uh, uh, do that in the if it costs us uh, native honeybees? Any other questions? Anybody have a favorite insect? What's that? Ladybug. They always make you happy. Yeah. Yes, and they're very, very good for, you, for the environment. Both the immatures and the adults eat uh, pest insects, so it's good to have them around. Rain mantis. That's a good one, too. <laughs> they're so cool, yeah. And there's so many things for Byron fire design, like really interesting eyes, the way they um, follow things. Um, yeah, very interesting. Dragonflies, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, it's, uh, so City, my graduate student, she studies dragonflies to, uh, she, she only wants to work on dragonflies, which is a little bit difficult, because uh, as a, I think as a scientist, you should be, dri be driven by the question, not necessarily the, uh, the organism, but anyway, she loves dragonflies, um, and she studies uh, what are the mechanical differences, what are the differences in the wings, the mechanical properties, between dragonflies that just you see around here, that kind of dart all the way around, and the dragonflies that can go across the ocean. They, they, there's dragonflies that go from Africa all the way to India. So they go to in, across the Indian Ocean. So uh, how are the wings different? And, um, and it has evolved multiple times, so um, it's gonna be an interesting project. Yeah. And when there's a cost involved, there's also uh, the human factor, which is kind of 
sprayed with mosquitoes that would want to be bitten. I heard one mosquito in that day he was a spray that wanted to get bit. So how do you get that mindset to change? Yeah. And I don't I don't know the answer, but we're all concerned about right. and I know there's been a shift from spraying to large sizes. And I don't know if one is better than the other, but yeah. you know, I would love to get your thoughts on <laughs> Yeah. Uh um, and again, I, I probably can, uh, there's many people at the Illinois, at the University of Illinois that study mosquitoes and will study exactly this, even in, especially in ur also in urban settings. Um, uh, and we've learned a lot of lessons about how not to do it, right, in, from, from history. Like we, we are how to deal with the public in this situation, like, um, you know, just spraying like coming in in the middle of the night. Like this happened in California. Like when I lived there in the, eight, the late 80s, early 90s, helicopters would come in in the middle of the night <laughs> to spray. Here. Right. That it's like, here. that is not a good way to oh, engage the public. Here. Yeah. 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 So I have great hopes for the um, uh, genetically modified uh, mosquitoes, the ones that I've been doing, and uh, that I can be very specific to certain species of mosquitoes. So which uh, bird people is also really important. You don't want to kill all mosquitoes. You just want to kill the ones that cause diseases, which also hap don't happen, they are not native to, to here. So um, you can vary, uh, then this has been tried in Key West, so, so more like uh, island habitats and it's, and it's working pretty well. So, um, so yeah. I mean right now, what? Yeah, the larval, larval side is probably safer, uh, but still it's not, Perfect. And yeah, cover yourself, spray yourself, um, and uh, uh, make sure there's no uh, uh, containers with water in your yard and in your neighbor's yard and the neighbor's yard. So, yeah, so that's education. Yeah, I think. The village is trapped with the controlling mosquitoes. I know. I know. Say that again? The village is. is You know, we don't need to get kids uh, more work to be done on that because some parts of town get a lot more mosquito abatement and mm -hmm. more control than other parts of the community. Yeah. So yeah. it's a, it's a, how do you change people's minds about spray yourself instead of spraying in the middle of the night? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And, but, and, and also spraying yourself uh, is, 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 you know, it has to be DEET and picaridin because the other stuff is just not that great. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it's fine, right? Like, you know, don't drink it, but you can cover yourself and then take a shower at night, but it's not as bad. Well, one of the um, topics of this board is um, lectins being sort of um, blighted or not. Mm -hmm. One of the big things, I mean, I know that in the newsletter, <laughs> that there's a great flight in the newsletter Yeah, light pollution is terrible, and and I'm only now try now coming to um, to recognize how many organisms are affected by it. Yeah, I agree. Uh, uh, the, and then we haven't even we haven't even touched on um, vibrational uh, pollution, right? Insects communicate a lot, and probably birds too through vibration. Uh, just being on a, on a substrate and, and then an insect a little bit further will be tapping like, and that's how we actually communicate. And if you have a lot of machines going left and right, it's, gonna, it's really messing up. Um, uh, well, same with, I think it affects snakes, it affects, um, um, uh, what was the other talk I went to? Uh, definitely spiders and so on. So yeah, it's, it's kind of sad. But uh, light pollution, we, we know for sure that that is bad for them, and especially moths. They just like they just 
circle on that one point and then it's a death spiral. Why did they try to make a rifle? Because um, they actually used the moon as a way to communicate, as a way to, um, sorry, if the moon is always is far away, and so you're always going in a straight line, you just, you just have it like at a certain point. Oh, th okay, so this is how I learned it. Like they, they, they know that it's there and they go in a straight line and always keep it at a certain angle. So now if you put a light there, they're actually going to go, because the light is actually closer, they will go in a spiral. Now it turns out that that is actually not the <laughs> reason, like the, the, they, they figured out that the nervous system is actually integrating it a little bit differently, um, but in the principle is there. It just, it just, it's evolved to use the moon, and now you're putting lights in its way. So we're, we're learning that the color of the light also. I'm not sure. It's supposed to, you know, not draw the moths right. as much. Right. I can't remember if it was better than. Yeah, maybe um, not as much, but yeah, still. Yeah. I don't know. I actually don't know. I don't know. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, what what uh, insect sees uh, every insect is also different, right? Like how they how they actually see and how they, you know, they can see ultra. Some can even see ultraviolet. The other one can see um, infrared. Um, so they have actually, as a whole group, they can see very seemingly. Of course, each individual species might be uh, on a certain part of the spectrum that's very particular. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it's not happier news. Thank you. Well, sorry it was not about birds, though. You got, uh, I can try to answer a bird question. Well, well I think we, we, we focus on the birds because uh -huh. we see them. Yeah. And you forget about the yeah. moths because they're flying around at night. And maybe they're just kind of annoying, too. You know, they're yeah. not keeping us from doing anything like right. that. But right. I think that we're finding out that there's so much more than what we can even imagine. Yeah. And it's all interconnected. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your. Oh, okay.